Once upon a time, in a land filled with nostalgia known as the past, an entity existed that tried to make good and creative games, a business that, nowadays, anyone would not associate it with that, but with other venues, such as football, where followed with Hideo Kojima, or, for more cultural people, Pachinko. I am of course talking about Konami, a company that now is synonymous of great IP being wasted and left in the dust, and, of course, of Pachinko, that announcement is still going to remain in everyone's memory. However, it wasn't always like this. Silent Hill, Castlevania, Metal Gear Solid, those are some of the most important series that were born under Konami's wing. Amidst all of this, however, Konami also created other video games that are more or less worthy of being remembered. One of these is the subject of this video, Other Dreams, a mix of the dungeon crawler and monster collector gens, together with also other ones, that was published in Japan in 1997 and in the West in 1998 for the PlayStation 1, with some content being cut, such as the ability to marry and to date a certain charter. A remake of this game was also published between 1999 and 2000 on the Game of Color, with some additions and also many elements being cut again from the PS1 version, namely the city building and the dating sim aspects. While the critical reception back then was kind of average, uh, if you search on the internet, many people actually have fond memories of it. Because of this, in the last weeks I went back and played the PlayStation 1 version of Hazard Dreams in order to ask a specific question. How did it age? And can it still be enjoyed even nowadays? So sit back, relax, and enjoy this retrospective on Hazard Dreams, the dungeon crawler that tries to do all but was forgotten during the years. The game takes place in the city of Mons Baia, near which is located a building called Monster Tower, inhabited by monsters that can only be seen there. Because of this, Mons Baia thrives of treasure hunters that enter the structure in order to obtain items to be sold outside with the most important ones being monster eggs, as the tower is the only place where these eggs can be found and, because of this, they fetch for a really high price. Moreover, monsters born from these eggs can be tamed and used as companions called familiars, something that many tamers do as their job. One of these is the father of the protagonist, Guy, who, however, after a trip inside the tower, never comes back, while its familiar returns bring a moment of him. Because of this, the protagonist's family is left without their main source of income, so the protagonist wants to take the place of the father and venture inside the tower, also to find out about the fate of his dad. However, he has to wait until he's 15 in order to do this, and thus, after he hits that threshold, he starts venturing inside the tower together with a familiar he met during its first trip, CUNY, in order to finally find the answers he's looking for. And all to earn money. Okay, you see this plot? Well, to this is practically dedicated only the interactive video, which is where the majority of the game's lore is actually located, and the first 10 minutes of the game. So it is easy to guess that As the Dreams doesn't have its main focus on the story, but more on the gameplay. Honestly, the plot is there more to justify why are you doing the things you are doing rather than for anything else, so the only important thing that actually happens in terms of it is what you discover when you hit some of the last floors of the tower. Now, I'm going to leave you a bit of time if you want to skip, as I'm going to spoil what is going to happen. Okay, now let's talk about it. At the first of all four, you encounter this monster tamer called Beldo, who admits to a kill cause father and that, if the protagonist wants to know more, he has to get stronger and reach the 40th floor, where he will reveal everything to him. After arriving here, it is discovered that Beldo and Guy actually teamed up in order to reach the top of the tower, where the ultimate egg, said to be containing the strongest monster ever, was apparently located. However, when they arrived there, Guy was actually killed by Beldo, who aspired to get his hands on that egg, as he has the ability to fuse with monsters, and with the strongest one between them in his sight, he aspires to become the best monster tamer ever. Pretty lame reason if you ask me. However, before being killed, Guy succeeded in sealing the egg with a magic that can be broken only by using the blood of a strong monster tamer. Why? Because the game says so, no real reason is given for that. Because of this, Beldo sent Cuny, who actually was one of his monsters all along, to help us in order to make the protagonist stronger so that he could arrive at the top of the tower and become the sacrifice needed for obtaining the deck. After breaking the spell, Beldo tries to kill the protagonist in an unwinnable boss battle where, however, Cuny has a change of heart and helps Cody defeat Beldo, taking the egg for himself and then leaving, knowing what really happened to Guy and with the knowledge of being the first one to actually clear the tower and come out of it alive. If we strictly talk from the point of view of the plot, uh, this final has a lot of holes and unexplained things, but really, as Dreams doesn't really care about its story, it is there more to justify why you are partaking in a gameplay loop rather than anything else. So, knowing that the plot is more of a pretext rather than anything else, let's move on what is actually the main appeal of Azure Dreams, the gameplay. Azure Dreams gameplay is a mixture of various things. It is essentially a dungeon crawler mixed with a monster collector and with elements of dating sim and city building on the side. I know, it may sound as a bizarre mix of gens, but Azure Dreams makes it work, so let's see in detail how it faces every one of them. The game is, first and foremost, a classic dungeon crawler, with procedurally generated levels, apart from some specific ones that are the same or are taken from a pool of pre-made stages, see floor 1 and 2 as an example of this, stairs to get up to the next floor and traps that range from the normal damage ones to others that make the screen turn 180 degrees and invert the movement controls to more useful ones such as the ones that actually make you directly go to the next floor. There are no checkpoints inside the tower, so that means that if you die or you escape, you will always have to start from the first floor. However, this game is particular as in every time you die or you escape, 
the protagonist level resets to 1, while the only ones that actually keep their levels are the familiars. This means that the only way you are going to get stronger is by acquiring better gear and improving it, which is done by the use of red sand for weapons and blue sand for shields, two somewhat rare materials that can only be found in the tower, and by leveling up familiars, as these are the only things that have the possibility to improve between different runs. In the tower you will be able to find items such as wards, wands, shields, herbs to recover from status alignments or for recovering HPs, fruits to restore familiars and MPs, and other objects with useful effects such as bells that make so that every enemy in our room escapes from you or scrolls that show you the exit to the floor you are currently in. The most important item you can find there are monster eggs which you can use to obtain a familiar, however I am going to talk about this later on. A thing you have to keep in mind whenever you venture inside the tower is that, if you die inside it, you lose everything you own when you were there, so all the money you picked up, your equipment and every item you had, except for your familiars. So in a certain sense we can call Azurins a sort of roguelike, though I am not sure whether this definition can be actually used for it, as your familiars still keep their level if you die, but in a certain way it fits the normal criteria of the genre, and even Wikipedia acknowledges it as a roguelike, so I think it is a simpler method to define it, though I think it still is a bit of a stretch to do that. Returning to the gameplay, there are only two ways of escaping the tower, use a wind crystal, which is an item that you can find there, or make one of your familiar eat an onion fruit, which will make the familiar disappear and you come back to the town alive and which is, by the way, the worst way of returning to the city. This means that sometimes you can find yourself wasting a run simply because you entered the tower without a crystal and slash or you didn't find one inside there, which can be frustrating. I can't testify for that as it happened to me, I have to say, not that many times, as wind crystals are quite common, but it still can happen. This, I have to say, is an old choice of game design. I think that it would have been better to give to the player the possibility to retrieve whenever he wanted or even simply at the end of every floor, as then the loss of equipment would have become a more risk-reward scenario where the player actually decides whether he wants to play conservatively or risk more with the possibility of losing everything. By being able to escape only by using a wind crystal or an onion fruit, the game makes it more difficult for the player to run away when it feels like it reached the limit of what it is possible for it at the moment, and instead, it trusts it inside a situation where the risk of dying and losing everything increases steadily, which can result in a rage quit from the game if the player loses the equipment on which he was actually working for hours and hours. This system works in case of emergencies, but not during normal administration, where you are kind of cruising until you arrive at a certain threshold where you understand that you are going to be in trouble beyond that point. If this system was sustained by the one I explained before, the game would have probably benefited from it. Hmm. Are you hearing Arco Games in the background saying, You are too soft, this is how you should play games. Back in my days, this was the norm. I had to walk 5 kilometers to get to school to mount the streets filled with bears. Because I think I am. Moving on, when you enter the tower, you cannot only bring 5 items with you, also counting your familiars. So, considering you will normally bring 2 familiars, a weapon, and a shield, it leaves you in one space to use for something else, such as a wind crystal, an earth to replenish HP, or a fruit to replenish MP. But then, inside the tower, you have an inventory that can contain up to 20 items. When you escape from the tower, you'll be able to sell everything that you have in your inventory, and this is going to be your main source of income until later on. This is for what concerns the exploration part. Now, let's talk about the combat system, a normal turn based one which is not that much complicated, to be honest. Every floor is nothing more than a grid where every time you perform an action a turn passes and the enemies react to that. It's a your turn my turn system, where if you do nothing and stay still, the situation does not evolve and the enemies do not act. Whenever you face an enemy, there are a few things you have to keep in mind. First, the height of the tail on which you and the monsters are. If you are located higher than the monster, you will inflict more damage and receive less, while if the situation is the opposite, you will receive more damage and inflict less. Secondly, you will have to consider your familiars. You have the possibility to evoke them and retrieve them whenever you want, and you have two ways of using them. You can command them directly, telling them what to do in the next turn, or you can set their AI to a certain set of actions. Your five levels. Stay still and do nothing, follow you and do nothing, use mixed magic on you, which powers the protagonist attack and makes it become of the specific element based on the monster magic, attack directly and attack aggressively, which will make it so that the familiar is going to seek out enemies and kill them on sight. In third place, you'll also have to consider what element uh, your familiars and the enemy are. A monster can have one between three elements, water, fire and wind, and we work in a rock, paper, scissor type of way. Fire beats wind, wind beats water, water beats fire. By default, the protagonist has no element, well, that is not a monster. But if you have a familiar set to use extra magic, his attack will become of that element, inflicting more or less damage depending on the monster he's fighting. You can also change the timing of a monster by using on it a certain item that permits you to do so, which is a great way to be able to actually face adversities if you have the right items and to be able to strategize around a problem. Another thing you have to look out for is your familiar MPs. Just by being out and attacking, they consume MPs, and if you finish them, they will stay put in place, without doing anything, which 9 times out of 10 means they are going to meet a certain death. Now you are prepared to fight a monster, so let's talk a bit about an important part of your trips inside the tower. The monsters, aka the monster collector part. At the start you are going to have only CUNY. However, inside the tower you can find monster eggs, which unfortunately do not immediately tell you what type of monster they contain. 
You can find it out by using a particular item inside the tower or by returning to the town where it will be automatically identified. There are two ways of obtaining a new monster from an egg. You can etch it in the tower or in the city. If you do that in the tower, you will obtain a monster that has the same level as the protagonist when you etch it. However, if you leave the tower, the monster will disappear, so it is a good solution only if you plan to actually make a deep run and you need more familiars to help you. If you men in town instead, they are going to stay in your house where you can store them and decide which of them to bring in the tower with you. At the start you will be able to store only up to 4 familiars and bring with you only an active one, but by progressing in the story, you can bring up to 2 familiars inside the tower and store up to 64 of them in your house. Now, what can you do with these monsters? Well, you confuse them. If you take 2 familiars with you in the tower, you can fuse them to obtain one of the familiars with a new ability and a possible new element. For example, in my playthrough I fused my Cuny with a Cyclone to obtain a Cuny with the passive ability of consuming half MPs when out in the field, which is pretty useful. This is the part of the game you can mess with however you want by trying to fuse every monster you come across until you find a combination that actually satisfies you. There are approximately 45 different familiars, also counting evolutions, because, yes, some of the familiars can actually evolve when they reach level 20. For example, Clown becomes Death and Flame becomes Everything, and they are two of the most useful familiars out there in the wild. Though, I have to say, the various familiar stats are kind of similar, so it is not going to make a real difference whether you bring a certain familiar or another with you, what matters the most are their abilities and elements. We have faced everything that concerns the tower, so let's move to the town and let's see what you can do there. Well, first, let's look at the city building aspect, also called the only method you have to use the money you have earned in the tower apart from buying furniture for your mother. Kinda sounds like a novel title. At the local carpenter, you will have the possibility to construct various buildings in the city, for some of which you will have to talk to specific people in order to unlock them and also to progress up to a certain point in the tower, which sometimes works as a flag for these types of discussions. You can build various buildings from expanding your house to creating a casino to build an horse race track which is also the fastest way to earn money by the way. Apart from the house expansions and the art ones, these buildings serve either the purpose of enabling love interests, see the hospital and the theater as an example, or to give you the possibility to play some minigames such as the amusement park or the race track. They also make your competitors happy if you care about it. At the end of the day, the city and the tower have a symbiotic relationship as the gameplay loop you are going to be in is this. You enter the tower, you find stuff, you escape, you sell that stuff, you improve your gear, you invest what you earn in the tower, and then the cycle over starts. So you will find yourself naturally progress with the city construction along with you getting better at exploring the tower until you have mastered both of them. In the city it is also possible to find some side stories that can enable you the access to some structures or to some romances. Namely there are three side quests you are going to get access practically right away. The pool one, which gives you access to, you probably guessed it by now, the military base. Of course I'm joking, it gives you access to the pool. The blue cave one, which makes it possible to start with my romance. And the windmills one, which gives you access to some quality octopus dumplings. Before moving on, let's talk a bit about the city. While it has some stores, you will practically never find yourself visiting them, simply because they don't have nothing to sell and they also mean that, so the only store you are going to actually visit is the one of fur, which sells furniture, the same clothes the protagonist is wearing, a strange motorcycle and some gifts. Apart from that, the city is comprised of the various villagers' houses, which at the start really don't like the protagonist but then come to actually do, a restaurant, a bar, an hospital, a temple and full stop. Though there is to know that many of these places are actually useful for the dating sim aspect. Apart from the fortune teller shop, which gives you hints on the various girlfriends available and on other stuff too. If you are bored, go there, maybe it will give you some ideas about what to do. So, finally, here we are, the dating sim. Let's brief us a thing. This is the less well finished aspect of the game, as there wasn't really the need to include it, but hey, they did it. I'm surely not going to complain about it. I like when they include the dating sim aspect in stories, it makes them feel... uh, realistic. It is easy that, in the life of a normal human being, romance can be part of it, so why should video games about doing that? This game, after all, follows the protagonist's life, it is absolutely sense that he has the possibility to partake in romantic activities. I have another thing to say though, and this applies to every character interactions present here. We decided that it was a good idea to have every character in the game be a representation of passive aggressiveness. Maybe it is because the translation isn't exactly the best, but damn, the majority of the interaction in this game, even between the ghost and the protagonist, are permeated by a sense of passive aggressiveness that is kind of strange. Anyway, let's take a look at the 7 ghosts you can actually romance in the game. We have Selfie Rhodes, the sister of the protagonist's friend and rival Gosh, a rich snob that believes the real rumor her brother tells her about Ko. Vivian Merka, a dancer that loves dancing and is probably the least passive aggressive charter of the entire game. Nico Selfie, the protagonist's childhood friend, a tomboy that is interested in culture and wants to improve the city. Mia Miria, a bookworm that likes to stalk people and has those horrible otaku glasses that make me question who actually thought of putting them on her. Cherry Child, a sickly girl that just wants to live outside but is constrained in bed. Patty Pen, the child of the local restaurant Sona that runs after you if you don't pay for your food, yes, you can do that in this game, and he's good at making fried shrimps, and finally Fargots, the general store shopkeeper that is the sooner of the game and likes you only if you buy her merchandise. 
When you have to roam around town to actually initiate the routes, and there is no clear indicator about what you have to do to initiate or to continue them either. For example, in order to start Patty's Romance, you have to eat every dish at the restaurant at least once, but no one says that to you, except maybe for the fortune teller, that I cannot testify for. So you have either to look to a guy to discover it, or to just mess around with the game trying to figure it out yourself. Still, are very enjoyable as routes? I mean, they sure exist. Uh, to be frank, they aren't all the bad, but they are not exactly unforgettable. Some are better than others, and in my opinion, the best is probably the Shari one, but they are nothing to talk about. The common denominator they all have is Gosh, Saifi's brother, a rich playboy that doesn't understand women, trying to make the protagonist seem an idiot and something to be avoided so that he can have all the goals for himself, miserably failing every single time. Anyway, what do you get when you finish your romance? Well, a sticker on your save file, which makes it seem like instead of collecting most of your collecting romances, and the chance to get them waking you up and then kissing you when you leave home for the tower. Oh, also, with the biggest house it is also possible to have all of the ghosts you are in a relationship with be present and send you off with a kiss in true arm style. And the protagonist's mother is okay with that, that's crazy. <laughs> These are the various aspects that constitute the gameplay of Fast Dreams. So, how is it? Honestly, it is really satisfying. The gameplay loop that the game offers, so going to the tower, returning home, developing the town and your relationship, improving years, rinse and repeat, is strangely addictive and you can easily spend hours doing that without really being bored by it. And I know that because I wasted an entire day doing that. However, there are some problems, namely the familiar leveling, the method improving gears, and the difficulty. You see, the X scaling of familiars is really slow. Because you always start at the bottom of the tower, leveling your familiar is going to be difficult unless you are able to venture into higher floors, which is normally not always possible, as there are some where it is really easy to just be literally obliterated when you appear there. Because of this, at a certain point it is kind of hard to progress basing on only your familiars, which is absolutely okay, they are there to help you, not to carry you around in bridal style. However, this leads us to the next problem, improving gear. The only way you can do that is by using red and blue sand, which is something rather rare to actually find. There are times where you will find 5 blue sands without any trouble at all, spaced out by lots of runs where you will be unable to actually find one. Gear, especially in the upper floors, is more important than familiars, as if a familiar dies, you are still alive, but if a protagonist dies, then it's over, so having a good defensive and offensive power is necessary to actually reach the top. Still, the method of improving gear is too much random. It would have been better to have the blacksmith available in town able to upgrade your weapon with money, as the only thing that it is actually useful for is, as I've already said, buying furniture and buildings. So why not make it useful also for upgrading gear, so to make advancing in the tower more fluid and less erratic? This also connects to a problem of difficulty. While the game is never unfairly difficult, there is to say that it is easy to find a roadblock once every 5 floors, which creates this cycle where you will go for a lot of runs that always end at the same floor until you have a bit of luck, find things that can make you push further on, and then you will start climbing the tower until the next obstacle. I think the major roadblocks in this game are the 25th floor and the goddamn 15th floor, I still continue to see Electro Kraken as the definitive enemy of Fast Dreams early game. This problem is simply created by the two precedent ones I have talked about. Because you are going to cover the same floors, it is going to be difficult to level your familiars. If you don't have luck, it is going to be hard to upgrade gear. So, if you were particularly unlucky, you can remain stuck for dozens of hours on the same set of 5 floors because of this. However, once you reach floor 3rd and 4th, well, yeah, from there the game becomes rather difficult and transforms itself in a hide and seek game rather than anything else. You can still advance quite far if you actually strategize, have good luck and take it slowly, after all there are people who clear the tower on the first try, but if you're not helped by Lady Luck, uh, there is a hard limit to that. Okay, let's assume you clear the game. Is there something to do after that? Well, you can finish constructing the buildings on your left, you can close the Roma's routes you have not finished and continue playing like usual, maybe try and make guys ghost around floor 48 and collect every monster the game has, but apart from this, the game offers nothing new as a boss game. So much so that if you arrive again at the 40th floor of the tower and you don't have a wind crystal, well, you're stuck there and you have to restart the game. <laughs> As for how much this game lasts, well, it kind of depends on how much you are lucky. I finished the main story in 25 hours, but I also had a lot of luck in the run that brought me to the 40th floor, as before that, I only succeeded in a run into the 30th one, so I can easily see someone needing 40, if not 50 hours to finish this game. However, realistically, I think that in order to clear the tower, you are probably going to need around 35 hours, depending also on how you decide to play. Still, I think that after 25 hours you are probably going to feel a little bit frustrated at the game for not giving you what you need to improve, because that is what was happening to me around the 20 hour mark, which can be a soft quit moment for some with not that much patience. Now, I won't talk about the graphics because, mate, it is a PS1 game, what do you want me to say? If you like retro graphics, you will probably like it, while if you want only the best with graphic options, optimization, ray tracing support, uh, you are obviously in the wrong place. However, there are some things I still would like to talk about here. 
First, every 5 floors the tower changes teams, and some of them are honestly good, while some are... random. Secondly, on the main point of this section, the charter portraits look strangely creepy. I mean, look at how fur turns herself just by changing a bit of the perspective, she seems totally another person. It is obviously an art style that belongs to the 90s, before the coming of the Moai wave, but I don't know, I don't really like it. As for the music, the soundtrack is okay. I think it is adequate for the desert setting of the city and of the adventure of exploring a dangerous tower. Still, I think it is mostly forgettable, especially because you will end up hearing the same tracks way too many times, so while I think it wasn't bad, I still think they could have done more under this aspect. Moreover, and I do not understand why they did that, the western edition of Hazard Dreams doesn't have voiceover, but the Japanese one has. Was including Japanese voice acting really that much strange for the 90s? Azure Dreams is a good dungeon crawler that doesn't try to do anything revolutionary, meshes together phone jams that aren't exactly that much connected, and yet it comes out as a good game, with a satisfying gameplay loop, an also great editing scheme side part, and an absolutely useless for money and merchants. So, to answer the question I posed at the start, should you play Azure Dreams even nowadays, even in 2023? And honestly, yeah, I think you should, especially if you like dungeon crawlers, because its gameplay loop is its biggest strength, and I still think it can be enjoyed even today. Of course, if you can look over dirty graphics, otherwise, well, uh, what are you doing here? I think also that people who like quirky and strange games can enjoy Azure Dreams, as it is just an example of how to mesh together gems that seem to be too distant from each other, and obtain a product that is still of good quality, and that somewhat succeeds in its experiment. Personally, while I was actually quite frustrated in some moments, especially when trying to pass the 15th and 25th floor, I still had a blast with this game. It has been a while since I really had this feeling of wanting to play a game, even when I should have done something else, and I was surprised by this, because I didn't think that I would end up enjoying Azure Dreams as much as I did. Anyway, this is all I wanted to say about Azure Dreams. If you arrived here, thank you very much for watching this video. As always, if you want to see more content like this, consider subscribing to the channel, consider leaving a like if you liked the video, and all the other stuff that YouTubers normally say. So apart from this, I don't think I have anything else to say. So this was all from Sigmoni, and I'll see you all in my next video.